Hi, and welcome to section 20 of the Anatomy Online Review. This time we'll be looking at imaging of, of the lower limb. Well, let's get into it. Here we can see an AP view of the pelvis, where you can definitely pick up this anterior superior iliac spine. And you can see this location of the lucency related to the sacroiliac joint. Uh, oftentimes you'll see C-shaped sacroiliac joints because of the um, disposition between the posterior and lateral components of this. The anterior sacroiliac joint tends to be more lucent and more lateral than the posterior. You can see a nice pubic symphysis. Remember this is going to be fibrous cartilage band in between. Notice how the pelvic brim is easily visible and this is a point where you want to follow around the edge of that pelvic brim and make sure it's nice and smooth and uh, look for any dis differences between the left and right side of the os coxae as they attach there. You can see the inferior pubic ramus. This is where the genitalia and the um, perineal membrane will come across. And then finally, the ischial tuberosity, which is projecting posteriorly. Look for avulsion fractures along this area, especially in a younger population. The greater trochanter. Um, this is going to be a major attachment point, and if there's a fracture anywhere on the neck or the intertrochanteric fracture, uh, this could be pulled away from the segment, and you'll want to look for the lines of approximation. Here you can see the lesser trochanter, which is where the iliopsoas muscle is going to be attaching. Again, there can be avulsions of this. And then a really important area that you look very closely at would be the neck of the femur and the acetabulum with the head of the femur as well. Look for good congruity. Look for the edges of the acetabulum to be nice and smooth. Make sure there's no um, broken edges, which will indicate that there could be some kind of cartilaginous damage or labral damage. And then, of course, the shaft of the femur itself that you can see anteriorly uh, looks nice and thick. There's a good cortical bone. It shouldn't be too lucent. Uh, that can be a sign of osteoporosis or degenerative change. You wouldn't want to see a big density inside of that either because this could be an indication of an osteosarcoma because they oftentimes will associate with the long bones of the limbs, especially down towards the knee. Let's move on to the knee in this slide. We have both an anterior and a lateral view. So let's look at the medial and lateral side. The condyle that you can see here indicated is going to be on the medial side because the medial condyle is more superior than the lateral condyle. Another indicator that you can tell is by looking below the knee and trying to find the fibula because you know that it's always located posteriorly. You can see the intercondylar spines. These intercondylar spines or the intercondylar eminence will serve as attachment points for the menisci. And then on the edges of each of those, you'll have the attachments of the cruciate ligaments. Notice the nice gap that's between the two condyles. If that one is lower than the other, that could be a Q angle problem, or it can be a meniscal problem where one is wearing away. Arthritic indications will uh, come into being with that line between the two. And of course, the presentation that the patient comes to you with. Here's a sagittal MRI of a knee joint. Notice how the bone is not white. This is an indication right away that you're looking at MRI, not CT or plain film. Also notice that you can see good detail on the muscle soft tissues. And this will be an indication that you're using MRI. And, and you can even pick out a fiber direction in each of these muscles, which can help you in determining which muscle you're actually looking at because you can tell the fiber direction of it. We'd looked at this one a little bit earlier in the presentation. I just wanted to draw together some of the things that you might also be interested in, including the uh, space. Notice how the um, fatty tissues are black in this instance. And if the fat is black, then you're starting to um, anticipate that this is going to be a T1. Several structures you want to be aware of. This one shows nicely the lateral meniscus, and there's an anterior and a posterior portion of that. Um, you may see gaps or tears with an MRI in some of the tendons. So off of the patella, you can see the 
patellar tendon coming down to the tibial tuberosity and look for fluid accumulations in those. And a fluid accumulation in this one is going to show up a little bit whiter, such as with this suprapatellar bursa that has a little bit of fluid in it. Here's another knee MRI, and you can see that this is going to uh, show the great gray scale of the muscle fibers, especially that gastroc. Now you can see the posterior cruciate coming off of the femoral condyle down to the posterior aspect of the tibia. Notice how it is a lucent structure in this MRI. Um, and finally, you can get a better view of it in this picture. There you can see the proximal femur, the tibia. You can even make out growth plates in this view um, for the, both the femur and the tibia. So this is an immature person's leg. The gastronemius posteriorly. And you can see that ruptured posterior cruciate ligament where it's been pulled away from the femoral condyle. Notice how it's not going towards the femoral condyle. It's just kind of flailing around out there. If we move down into the ankle, we've seen the fibula follow and track the lines of the fibula, especially the entire distal third. That's going to be important because a lot of those POTS fractures that we've discussed earlier may have fractures somewhere along that distal third. Remember, this is a non-weight-bearing bone, and that can be easily seen in this view where you can see the fibula is really not accepting any of the forces that will be passed up through the talus. So the fracture of that fibula tends to be through the eversion of the ankle itself where the bones will come in proximity to one another and it will snap the fibula somewhere up as a little further high on the leg. On the tibia, very broad bone, again looking for osteosarcomas in the central medullary portions of that bone, looking for avulsions off of the bottom edges of that medial malleolus, and for any uh, pits or cracks coming up along the base of the tibia where it articulates with the uh, body of the talus. Here you can see the talus. The talus has a nice round head to it and uh, kind of that saddle body where it articulates with the tibia to the talocural joint. Then we can see this boat-shaped navicular, the nice square cuboid, and we don't have a very good view of the uh, cuneiforms. On this lateral view, though, we can see the same structures. Notice the overlaying of the fibula with the tibia at this point, but you get a much better view of the talus in this position. And this one is going to be what they'll go on to measure for any subtalar fractures uh, or the talus itself having a fracture through the neck. And there's the talus, that narrow portion just before it articulates with the uh, navicular bone is going to be susceptible to fractures. The calcaneus, uh, look for bone spurs on the posterior inferior aspects of this. And we talked already about the uh, fasciitis, plantar fasciitis. This area is susceptible to bone spurring because of the constant tension that can happen against that plantar fascia and may be significant for point tenderness as well. You may see, even in the soft tissues of this, because you can make out the heel, there may be some densities in there from um, infection or being fluid-filled because of uh, edema. You have a nice navicular bone, and uh, that's boat-shaped. Look for nice edges along this. Also, you can see very good joint spaces between each of these. Um, they're nice and even. So nothing's being jammed up against the other one, which can be an indication of problems. They don't look fallen, which can be an indication that they might have uh, arches which are um, degenerating. This is, can be particularly true in an older population that's experiencing a lot of foot problems where the bony architecture starts to give way. Other times it will be because of overuse injuries and the bones are being pulled at by some of the tendons like tibialis posterior tibialis anterior, they can cause evulsion fractures, fibularis longus will come in and around to help support arches and, and may yank off a piece of bone once in a while. Then we have these more anteriorly placed cuneiforms. Uh, there's three of them and they're very difficult to tell apart on this view. You will actually need a more superior or an inferior view to see all three of them lined up. 
and then the cuboid is kind of hiding over in the lateral view so you have to follow the lines of this bone particularly carefully um, and probably you'd want that second view in order to make sure that it was cleared from any fractures or uh, dislocation. We'll just move past this particular image um, take a moment and see what you can find here it's kind of for self-review uh, this will help you to get familiar with which bones you can see in which images and you can also take uh, note of the malleoli and the fibula. In this ankle x-ray in the AP view, um, now you can see that there's a little tiny fracture on the edge of the lateral malleolus and this is an avulsion fracture. This is going to be because of a history perhaps of a severe inversion and the ligaments that attach there could be either the anterior talofibular or the calcaneofibular ligaments depending on the history which one of these is sensitive to local palpation as well. Typically if it's non-displaced as this one is um, you really don't need to do much other than make sure that it doesn't come loose and try to mobilize that for a while. In this MRI of the foot you can see again this is clearly an MRI the bones are not are radio dense they have a grayscale factor to them and you can see the soft tissues of the foot what you might look for in this type of image is again the joint spaces some of the muscular compartments look for fluid accumulations in some of those compartments look for a uh, fiber direction and if there's any deviation of the fiber direction which can be an indication of fluid accumulation that's hydro dissecting between compartments and putting pressure on things uh, you can see that this person does have a little bit of what would be called a hammer toe where that metatarsal phalangeal joint has been extended on the um, dorsum of the foot so it's dorsiflexed whereas the distal components of the toe are plantar flex that will form a hammer toe. Just to identify a few things we have a nice view of the talus and the calcaneus all these midfoot structures and the first metatarsal medial cuneiform and then of course coming down into the phalanges. In this slide we have a 22 year old patient arriving after falling from a second story balcony. The following image is obtained and you can ask a multitude of questions from this based on either pure identification um, or asking about other symptoms they may have and this is typically something that you'll see as a history that would go along with a calcaneal fracture which is indeed what this person has. When you look at the side you can follow the posterior calcaneal uh, line around the edge towards the anterior side and you'll see an uh, oblique crack coming up superiorly through the calcaneus. This is going to definitely have problems. Um, they're often bilateral and it, the important thing to notice when you find a calcaneal fracture is there may be or should be suspicion of a compression fracture in the vertebrae as well. Remember we talked about those earlier and how many of them go undiagnosed. There can often be a foot compartment syndrome in association with these and the neurovascular compromises that can become problems if it's undiagnosed or untreated. Finally, if we look at this CT scan, it's a longitudinal cross section and you can now see there's a problem with this cuneiform right here. This cuneiform has uh, a major fracture on it and this is a result of a Lisfranc fracture, fracture which is a medial tarsal metatarsal joint fracture and these fractures were first described by a Frenchman uh, I think he was one of Napoleon's doctors. It's not that important, but it's interesting. And uh, you're going to have definite swelling and point tenderness, whereas weight bearing on these fractures is very difficult and very painful because there's so much importance on the towing off cycle of gait. So when you have this first compartment 
um, that can't bear the weight of that towing off faction, these people have significant limps and, and difficulty in, in ambulation. When they report the method of injury, many times it's reported as a folding under or hyperflexion of the forefoot. It gets forced underneath their body. Well, that concludes our look at the imaging of the lower limb. In the next section, we'll start dealing with